right. So first up in, in the hot seat, rotating between today, we have Professor Wes Cheney. Hi, Wes. Hi. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. Yeah. Um, it's... I know it's a busy time of year, so I, I appreciate you coming in and, and doing this. No problem. This. this is this is gonna be fun. Great. All yeah. right. Um, so why don't you just briefly explain like what it is you do with your own research and like what kind of classes you teach and outline that for everybody. Sure. Sure. So I'm uh, a professor of history here, or associate professor of history here, mm. um, and then I'm also affiliate member of the Asian Studies program. Okay. Yeah. And my main research focuses on the Qing Dynasty, which is the last imperial dynasty in China. Um, I focus on the 18th and 19th centuries and legal and environmental history. So I look at, um, if you look at a map of China, it's actually mm-hmm. in the cartographic center, but it's long been uh, an ethnic border borderland, an ethnic frontier um, on the edges of mm-hmm. the very northeastern edges of the Tibetan Plateau. Um, and I look at um, legal and environmental changes over the course of the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, so my, my primary focus is on, on legal disputes. I look a lot at land disputes. Mm-hmm. Um, so my, my own research is not, um, centered in art history. Right. Um, right. and it's very textual. Um, and I probably, I don't do a lot with, with visual sources or, with, yeah. um, material objects. Uh, but I enjoy using them for my teaching. So my, my yeah. own focus is on the 18th and 19th centuries, but, uh, here at Bates, as the only historian of China, I, I kind of have the whole thing to do. Mm, that's quite a lot, yeah. Yes, yeah. So <laughs> a, a, lot, a lot to cover. And what I found is um, going to the museum um, and using their collection of uh, Cultural Revolution uh, posters from mm. the um, 1970s has been really wonderful. So yeah, that's we, my main engagement with, with the museum. Those get broken out. All the time. That's what I found. Yeah, I've been right. working here for about a year now, just like mm-hmm. consistently in terms of what gets taken out for classes. Those posts get used a lot. Sure. Um, but I'm kind of curious as well. Like, um, how long have you been been teaching here? This is my seventh year. Okay. Yeah. So you've been here for a little bit then. Yes. So, wh- how did you first hear about using the museum's collection? What kind of drew you into that? You know, I don't, I don't remember exactly who was I the know, first I'm person really who calling would... you back a while. Um, but I so I heard that there was this collection of. Posters and and as well as a collection of um, a photographic collection uh, yeah, from the yeah. 1980s and 1990s, um, and I was particularly interested in in taking a look. And when I went to Olin, the the right before I started um, my first semester, mm. um, what really struck me was how different it you experience these posters in person rather than taking a look at them on a PowerPoint or online. Yeah, yeah. Um, the size comes across and you can begin to imagine how this might have looked on a wall of an office or a school or even hmm. your own home. Um, and so the kind of materiality of it, I thought was really important. Um, and it kind of hit me um, as I was looking uh, at that and hmm. um, wanted to, to share that with the students as well and begin to kind of think, you know, outside the box about what, uh, what, possible sources for writing history are. Um, I think we often think mm. of them as textual and that um, right. rarely think about you know, what a, a, a poster, how a historian might use a poster to write history. Right. So I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed doing that. Almost like being able to use an, an image like a text in a way to like read into what it is. That's exactly right, yeah. yeah. And it, I think it really pushes, pushes uh, students into the kind of type of analysis they do and forces them to, mm. to think in, in more creative ways yeah. um, rather than just kind of Rather than just say, like, this text says this about what happened. And there you're kind of on the level of summary. I mean, it really forces mm. you to kind of have a little more analytical edge right? Um, in reading the, the in reading the image. Yeah. Do you think that coming at it from that perspective, because you said, you know, you're not working in visual culture all the time. Like, right. Does that coming at it from that analytical writing perspective, does that mm. change how you view it? Is that like part of how you, that approach gets taken with students? Do you mean in my own research or wait? So it, yeah, there? or well, yeah, like when you take the classes in, like is uh-huh. it? How does that view like influence viewing an, an object? Is kind of I guess what I'm asking. I can say it on a couple of levels. I know for me, I think it's made me a better historian. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. It's made me, you know, I some of the stuff I work with, um, you you might class as like historical ephemera. So I mean, there mm. are archive sources I work with, but also. Things like uh, contracts and land deeds and stuff that have been found in villages that have a kind of material history to them too, mm-hmm. um, and and some of them have images on them. And so, I mean, it makes me take that more seriously rather than just what they say, but also you know the materiality of the source. Yeah, so it has, right. I think in that way it's made me a better historian. Um, for the students, I think it um, 
it brings home, I think, a little bit more uh, how the cultural revolution, things like the cultural revolution might have been experienced. So right. we, you know, at the in the level of lecture, you're talking kind of at a 30,000 foot level. Um, and the, I don't think you can really get an individual experience in that way. Um, yeah, because I know, like, yeah. I mean, in high school, we had a unit that was on the cultural right. revolution. And, right. and it, yeah, it is one thing to, to talk about in the classroom, but we, we took a visit um to the peabody essex uh, museum because they have oh, that, right. that house there yeah yeah you knew tong yeah right. that's amazing yes. yeah um and that was it, it did completely change being able to see it right and, and you know they actually have posters in there so because they yeah so they have yeah. actually mal posters that were on the walls when they deconstructed the house and then reconstructed yeah. it in peabody yeah. um and uh so i yeah it, th- that is exactly the type of thing that i think students can get at with seeing these in person and seeing them like on a wall, even if it's on a museum wall right. um, in a way that's different yeah. than on their computer screen. Um, you you could sort of get a personal experience through memoirs, but also there's not the kind of visual dimension to it. Right. Um, right. And I, so I mixing like say a memoir, going to museum, seeing the poster and then seeing, seeing a film, I think that can all yeah. get the, you both get the, um, kind of the color scape mm, of like mm-hmm. what are the what how would it what are the colors that you would see in the culture revolution what are what are the sounds oh, all that yeah, kind of stuff you can yeah. get at that um with these kind of sources rather than simply uh a text yeah well i think that that's i think that that's great yeah yeah well well thank you for sharing that yeah, i appreciate no your time yeah no i really enjoyed it i think it's it's a wonderful resource that that uh, olin has um, and it's uh, I've used it a lot in my teaching in a range of courses um, from my modern course, China course, to even my environmental history course. And it's it's really wonderful. Wow. Great. Well, yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you. All right. Yeah. Take care. Yeah. Um, speaking to your mic again okay. for a quick second. This is me, Kirk. Looking at a recording sign, being nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> On air. Excellent. Okay. Hello, All right. Lewiston. <laughs> yes. Welcome, Professor Reed, to the podcast. Uh, how are you doing? I know it's a busy time of year. So. I'm, I'm doing great. It's the last week of classes, and we're, you know, wrapping up all the things, and it's been, you know, a bit of a dramatic semester. Um, so yeah. I'm just trying to figure out what we threw overboard when all the things happened and what we're left with, and I'm yeah. feeling pretty positive. So, Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah dramatic is an uh, understatement. Understatement. Yeah. That's so. what, what are we going to call this? The troubles, the, the, the tragedy, the whatever. Uh, I know. interesting to yeah. see how it all... So, all right. Well, we've made it to the end, at least. We have. So, well, almost. Yep. Uh, for everybody listening who who doesn't know you already, what do you what do you teach? What do you study? What's your interest? So, uh, Kirk Reed in French and Francophone Studies, and I have I'm told on LinkedIn every year a number that d- d- defies reason, but I'm now 33 <laughs> years at Bates. I came in 1990, wow. so you know, many. Some teachers were not born before. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when I you might be here. like the only person I've talked to who's worked here longer than Anthony has. Yeah, yeah. So no, it's been a it's been a minute. So, uh, so anyway, that aside, um, I was hired as a early uh, literature specialist, which at Bates, so small means the Lascaux Cave paintings to the oh. French Revolution. Yeah, right. like it's a long span of time. <laughs> um, but because Bates is Bates, and you know, we had fewer people doing. Um, Having to do coverage, I, I ended up doing North Africa as a specialty and, and weaving that um, part of the Francophone world into my conversation class and just my content classes in terms of literature classes later, childhood in North Africa, mm. colonialism in uh, my seminars, just the, 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 the subject of the, the entire seminar. Uh, so it's inflected by uh, more than just now 16th century women right. writers. Right, and my... expanding outside of France itself to like exactly. the wider Exactly, exactly. We end up, in fact, Bates is somewhat peculiar and has been for a long time in that we study more, actually, or specialists in hmm. more outside of France than inside. Yeah. So, uh, but you have to know that. You have to know the classical French works to be able to speak coherently right. because those all the people who write in that world were educated in a very often very classical very traditional french system so the yeah. two speak to each other quite well yeah working together yes um great so uh tying into that uh those classes and things that you've taught have have uh connected with the museum before do you want to uh well, give some examples of that just great segue about what we were just <laughs> talking about yeah is exactly that when we think about traditional france and 
uh, you know, the Francophone world and how they interpret uh, some of that world, one of the most profound experiences for me at the museum was meeting with Lala Isaidi, who is a Moroccan um, uh, artist yeah. who takes traditional French Orientalist paintings of the 19th century, for example, de la Croix and Les Femmes d'Alger dans leur appartement, the women of Algiers in their apartment, mm -hmm. and reimagines it and looks at it, photographs with um, these models that she has posed in, wrapped in fabric, which she uh, has written her personal journal on, um, decontextualized some of that into a more feminist or a less orientalist uh, um, yeah. voyeuristic uh, pose and uh, and presented it as a you know a commentary on that so it's mm -hmm. exactly what i love to do and when when the museum said that oh we've got this exhibit and you know it was a french title and <laughs> and the woman the artist would be available to us like it was like yeah pennies from heaven so yeah it's been yeah. a really good a good way for me to use the the museum as a a learning tool for my yeah. class yeah and that um the grand uh, my french pronunciation is is worse than yours the the grand odalesque mm -hmm. uh yeah. is the piece that we have it's in the permanent collection yes um having seen like kind of what gets taken out and what gets used yeah. that piece is in is in the rotation it's oh, out every it's, semester it's so great yeah and you know students who are art majors or not or who have some even yeah self-reflective thing uh, thoughts about you know how art is produced or whatever anyone can come to that that photograph and have an idea. It's like, why are her feet so dirty? Like, what's what's that all about? And <laughs> yeah. what is she wrapped in? And I seem to remember that pose, but it's you know, odalisk is a thing. But hmm, how is this different? And I remember talking with Lalai Saidin saying yeah. she finds that work, the original work, pornographic. Like, why? Why, yeah, why is this woman kind of is? And, yeah, yeah it, it is <laughs> naked and just there for your delectation. Yeah. Uh, and so she said, no, I, I there is beauty in these paintings, but you know, let's rethink this and have us question uh, through the, what we do with the painting right. what the original was. So, yeah, great. I think that's one of the things that, yeah, having other departments come into the museum can do as well as it can tie into uh, bringing new perspectives onto the same works mm. that are in the the art history canon or something and uh, see them in a new light or, or reinterpret them in a new way. So Absolutely. It's great I, to classes too. I that. think across the arts. Yeah. You know, this has been my experience across the arts is that, oh, uh, you know, I I came to uh, Les Femmes d'Algiers, the women of Algiers, through an uh, uh, Algerian French writer, Asse Jebar, and thought of it through writing first. And I thought, oh, well, but this is a painting. Mm. Got mm -hmm. to meet her, actually, and had the confounding experience where she said, yes, but Kirk, don't forget that it's also, I was Orientalist, this woke <laughs> American scholar, like, oh, it's this horrible, we're, you know, denigrating <laughs> right. women. She said, but let's not forget that it's a beautiful painting right and yeah. i was like oh yeah. yeah so i had to look at it in my own way a different way and much like my experience in theater here was when i started doing theater with students and yeah. uh, after a long time i watched students learn differently and more profoundly through embodying uh some of the words on the page rather than mm. just just reading and getting a quiz or a test in the way we go to the museum oh when we look at the actual product and we see sort of visually and have to respond, it uses a different part of your brain and you're yeah. smarter for having, you know, been more capacious in your approach to these questions. I can I can say that uh, I am among, I think, many people who have enjoyed your, your theater performances no. greatly. <laughs> um, I'm thinking of, uh, I'll say, Stupid Effing Bird. Yes, yes, that was, a, that's a title that I don't get to say. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, uh, which I loved. I thought that was so great. great. So you've, you. you've brought that back into my head. <laughs> um, but before I, I let you go, I, I would be remiss not to, uh, ask about I know you teach a class on Tintin I do and I love the intersections between art and language and, and I was just kind of curious if you could uh, tell us a bit about that happy to uh, and this is another conundrum like when Asi Jabal says but don't forget it's a nice painting right? yes. I'm like okay you know don't forget yes uh, Hergé the, the author of Tintin wrote Tintin in the Congo and drew yeah. Congolese people looking a lot like monkeys it's a tough and, look yeah. Yeah, yeah and even Milou the little dog is snowy is smarter than these apps so it's like okay yeah. problematic and that's why I started teaching it uh, mm -hmm. was for colonialism and depictions of that. And I thought I was going to be completely undone by this and like, okay, Hergé is just a monster. And like, well, no, he's all the things. You can yeah. love him, you can yeah. criticize him, you can hate him, uh, but you can emulate and, and, and uh, as Lalai Seydi did with her work, you can turn it around. So yeah. the final project for that course is always 
And this again, it's like, I don't, I'm not an artist. You have to draw a you cover. You gotta try, yeah. You gotta try, and, and the first and last pages, so you're working with text and visually. And you know, it's often like, when I ask students to do drama in my 205 course, it's like, oh no. It's the ones who complain the loudest who end up being like kind yeah. of the best at this. So, Isn't that funny? Yeah. So we, we, we draw. We draw uh, a Tintin, or I can't, I think it's called uh, rewritten, rewriting or rereading mm. Tintin. Mm-hmm. And so they actually have to redraw him and reread him and rewrite him. So uh, it's a very great. popular course, and it's kind of. And I shouldn't broadcast this, but it's kind of my favorite to teach as well. Wow. Yeah. You've heard it from the You've man himself. Yeah. Yeah. All right, yeah. students, if you're listening, keep an eye out on registration. <laughs> Coming soon. Callers are standing by. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Thank you so much All for right. coming on doing yeah. that. Next up, we have Professor Jeremy Cornelius. Hello. Hello. Do you prefer Professor Cornelius, Jeremy? What's good? You can just call me Jeremy. All right. Nice to meet you, Jeremy. Nice to meet you, too. Um, thanks for coming in and doing this. I know it's a busy time of year, but I appreciate you taking the time. Um, for the good people at home, uh, what do you do as a professor? What do you what do you study? What do you teach? Yeah, so I'm a visiting lecturer in English. Um, and this semester I'm teaching uh, the Foundations of English Lit, which is the class that mm-hmm. I took for the museum. Um and uh, it's it, the class itself, um, the theme of it is mostly on the multiverse in literary oh. form. So we started reading this book. Uh, it's an edited collection. It's edited by uh, Valerie um, Faisal and Louise Geddes called The Shakespeare Multiverse. And the way well. they approach it is thinking about um, adaptation and fandom as a vision into the infinite multiverse, right? So, like, different narratives well, could exist in other realities, which, you know, check. <laughs> <That makes sense. laughs> um, yeah, sure. So, uh, we kind of started with that, and the text, the, the, uh, the play that I taught alongside the Reinhardt collection was Titus Andronicus by Shakespeare. Yes, I read that at Bates, actually. So. Oh, nice, nice. Very graphic. It is, it is. <laughs> and it also, um, and I'm not sure the way you were taught it, sometimes this sort of becomes a huge part of it and sometimes it's not, but um, Ovid had a huge influence yes. on Titus, especially um, uh, the myth of Philomela, mm-hmm. which is sort of what uh, he draws from in um uh, descri- uh, characterizing Lavinia in particular. Yeah. Um, so the I emailed Anthony. Yes. Uh, and uh, he very, like, I sent him my syllabus, and he very nicely um, was trying to kind of work with me on what to do. And he mentioned this, and I started looking at it. I was like, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. So, yeah, so you you guys were looking at the, the Wally Reinhardt's, I think it was, mm-hmm. and I think the Book of Only Enoch. Was that yes. the other thing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, I've given conflicting answers on this. I think the Reinhardts are maybe my favorite thing in the collection. Mm-hmm. They're up there. Um, how did that tie into the class? What were we looking at with those? Or I could describe them as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Weird. So, um, so I'm an early modernist by training, so mm-hmm. and a Shakespearean. Um, so I work a lot on like the early modern period, but also thinking about. Um, adaptation mm-hmm. and visual culture as well. So um, the way we kind of approach Titus is Titus is very much like a fictive vision of Rome. Like, right, it's yeah. not actually Rome. It doesn't, <laughs> which is yes. interesting for Shakespeare because a lot of times he actually does draw on all of these, you know, I put in scare quotes, historical texts in the sense sure. of like they were sort of often commissioned by sovereigns to kind of rewrite a particular history, right? Which Naturally. makes yeah. it really tricky sometimes for the early modern period and kind of historicizing it because you come up with all these like questions, gaps, you know. All yeah, this. yeah. Um, so the way I presented Titus to them was this is completely fiction <laughs> in terms of <laughs> a history of Rome. But what it is doing is it's drawing on a lot of the Senecan tragedy or revenge tragedies of the Roman period, right? Sure. So, or the Roman Empire. So it's drawing and sort of hyperbolizing all of those. But then within that, there's also a lot of Ovid that kind of comes up both mm. in direct reference, um, illusion, you know, um, the whole, uh, if anyone listening has read it, the whole like wood is often described as the Ovidian wood in the second act where mm. they're doing the hunt and that's where oh, Lavinia yeah, right. is assaulted. So once they kind of enter the wood, everything kind of becomes discombobulated and reformed and it's, mm. it's very sort of very Ovidian in all of its influences. So sure. for the visual art and the way I had my students think about it was how is Ovid adapted and, and sort of visualized in this way? And how does this 
compare to what we're seeing in terms of performances of Titus because you know Titus is a play oh, so yeah. we're always thinking about the visual performance of it and things like that that is um, such a great idea yeah, yeah so before I had them look at the collection I even talked a lot about how Ovid gets remade and what Ovid was doing in terms of remaking Greek myths sure. right yeah, so there's, there's yeah. this con- consistent sort of adaptation remaking you yeah. know over the course of like 2000 perception years yeah, it's going really, yeah exactly and We've spent a lot of time in the class, too, thinking about how adaptation involves um, interpretation, right? So, like, mm-hmm. when you stage a play, especially something like Titus, there's a lot of pieces that go into yeah. it. And thinking about the choices you're making about um, who is cast as Aaron, who is cast as Lavinia. <laughs> and there's, it's always going to read different depending on how you stage it. Yeah. So, in terms of thinking visually... Uh, We thought about the art in relation to that. How is it remade? How is it adapted? What are the interpretive parts of it that take on the visualization for the Reinhardt collection? That's so great. Because I just say, because like the reason I'm really, I'm really drawn to these. I mean, I was a a classical medieval studies major at Bates, so um, there's kind of a. Most people are really familiar with those mythic stories. They get taught them when they're young, and like. You get, they kind of hear them over and over again. And I think that they, they start to lose sometimes this kind of sheen of um, how actually weird and violent and sort of twisted they are. And what I love about the Reinhardt is that because they're so vibrant, um, and these will be linked in the description so people can see these, um, they kind of re-inject weirdness back into it. Like, I feel like I see it again, and it's like, it's revived with all of the strangeness of this, like, you know, the first time I read it. Yeah, and... I, I love that you say that because I, I was looking at the Stung by a Fury one in particular. Yeah, yeah. And that was one I, I think I had sort of mentioned to them a little bit to think about because, um, well, a few things. One, it, I, I liked how it's paneled. There yes. are panels to it. We're also talking about, we read Watchmen uh, oh, as well. Nice. And we actually oh, used, that's great. <laughs> that's what we did for the Jay uh, Bolton collection because of so much like paranoia. Right. And there's, sure. you know, there's like all of these sort of horrific visual images in it that are super like disturb you in your nightmares kind of situation. (laughs) But we started with this before and it was interesting because when my students first read Titus, they were so like, I I don't want to say overwhelmed, but like we, I had them read the first two acts and that's like a lot to ask actually. Yeah, no, And I warned, you know, I I gave them a heads up. I was like, you might want to read a summary of what happens just so you know um, Mm -hmm. what is coming because there's a lot, you know, and I I gave them kind of a preface on revenge and and violence and and stagings of it and things like that. Um, But still that first day they were sort of like, what is going on in this play, (laughs) both in the narrative and in the themes. They almost were just like, so... And I used um, uh, Marcus's speech when he first encounters Lavinia to think about that because it's it's a really interesting speech and in how he and a lot of trauma scholars have written about this about when you encounter something that is so bizarre and unsettling and yeah. violent and traumatizing, your reaction to it it's like you almost don't know how to respond. So <laughs> Marcus in that speech relies on a lot of Petrarchan conceits and yeah. sort of puts that as a way of that's almost the only way he can render the violence that he's witnessing. So I use that as an example for thinking about how we embrace or encounter Titus. And then I had them all like actually act out parts of the second act because it is so difficult. Yeah. And I was like, this might help, you know, with situating it. And some of my students brought up the, um, the Reinhardt collection, both to me individually and some in class, and thinking about how it's doing a similar effect. Yeah. Um, and, you yeah. know, when you encounter it, it's almost so much that you both kind of have to look into what the myth was that he's re- recreating yes. and yeah. then think about how he's doing the visual interpretation of it and putting it together. Yeah. Um, so I had them kind of think about translating that method into doing performance because I was like, you know, we're, we're sure. always sort of when we work creatively, we're always trying to think about critically about like what we're putting into the performance or the yeah. art piece um, and what choices, you know, we're making and we're, we're <laughs> and now it's, uh, we're watching um, both the uh, Spider-Man into and across the Spider-Verse oh, and also sure. thinking about that as well, about yeah. like all the different art styles and, but they represent different realities and, yeah. and they're different interpretations that are drawn from the comics and they oh, put them all together. So, cool. so I, I, I kind of, I didn't really bring up Reinhardt in that context. We're, we're talking about them tomorrow too, but yeah, um, I never would have thought to pair well. it with Titus Andronicus. I mean, that's, and that's great. I think that that yeah. works really well. Um, yeah. There was kind of a trajectory to get there. Yeah, we did sure. Titus, 
Um, what would you read? We read uh, Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World, which is like an early science fiction piece about mm. a character who goes into another reality with like talking hybridized like human animals. Wow. Um, and then we read uh, Phyllis Wheatley's lyric poetry and talked about visions of like almost an alternate reality yeah. in terms of like histories of slavery, but why that's really important for her writing about it. Yeah. Um, especially like in the, what we looked at were, you know, poems published in like 1773. And then um, we read Toni Morrison's Paradise. And then we mm. read, uh, oh, Watchmen before that, then Toni Morrison's Paradise. And now we're doing Spider-Man. So it's been an interesting wow. kind of tracing. And what I've put the whole context into is thinking about it all as a kind of multiverse, which is kind of what we yeah. started with. But everyone's been intrigued by that. And especially now seeing it come to full fruition in Spider-Man, where they're actually seeing... Very much in the culture. Yeah, exactly. So, um, wow. Well, yeah. I'm glad that the museum was able to... <laughs> Uh, at least be some small part of that. That sounds like a really interesting course. Um, so you're making me a little bit jealous. Like, man, <laughs> I wish I could have taken that. Um, but great. Okay. Well, I think that that should be good. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, of course. Thank uh, you for having me. I yeah. appreciate it. And I'll uh, hopefully we'll see you again sometime. That'd yeah, that sounds so. great. All Thank right. You. Take care. Thank you.